Okay. <laughs> Yay. Super excited today to have Katie Sosnowski, who's in the same lab as I am. We're working on the same projects and she's just an absolute little genius. Katie, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Thanks, Elaine. As Lane said, my name is Katie Sosnowski. I'm a second year PhD, PhD student in biomedical engineering at the University of Arizona. And I have so much fun collaborating with Lane on different projects in the lab. Stop it. Okay, well, I am so <laughs> excited. <laughs> I am so excited to have you here today because this is a first video. So huge milestone, gonna go down in history. And B, we're gonna be talking about the microbiome, which is the coolest thing. I'm starting to hear about it more and more and I don't really get it. <laughs> so really excited to have you explain it to us and then a bit of the research that's been happening. Cool, I'm excited. So why don't you just start us off? Like, let's get the definitions down. Can you tell me like, what is a microbiome? Yeah, that's a great question. That, I think that word gets thrown around a lot and the word microbiota also gets thrown around a lot. They're very similar words and they're slightly different. So microbiome has to do with the genetic instructions for all of the different microorganisms in a specific place in the body. So for example, you have some bacteria in your intestines. And if you were to sum up all the genetic material of all those different you know, bugs, so to speak, that are in your intestine, that would be the microbiome for your intestine. And the microbiota would be all those different bacteria, viruses, fungi, anything that's in there. Um, all of those collected together would be called the microbiota for that region. So they're similar, but they do mean different things. Yeah, basically microbiome refers more to the genetic part, whereas microbiota refers to the, the cells themselves, or in the case of viruses, the viruses themselves. And also bacteria, right? Yeah, the microbiome includes bacteria, fungi, uh, viruses, all stuff that sounds bad, but actually a lot of it's really good for you. Yeah, I love that. I think that's the coolest thing. Uh, on surface level, it sounds kind of creepy that we have all this other stuff. But then the more I learn about it, it's, it's fun. It's like you have a whole ecosystem everywhere. Yeah, it's super cool. And actually, a lot of them are known to be helpful for protecting you against disease. So for example, there's a bacteria in your skin, like particularly on your face, and it releases a protein that may protect you against psoriasis. So if you didn't have that bacteria, you might have less acne, but you would be more prone to psoriasis or other skin conditions. So these things are very important. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I already want to get into the biosensors bit because that's how you detect what's what it is that's there, right? Yeah, that's right. A lot of times uh, biosensors haven't really been used yet for microbiome stuff, but they are very useful for detecting multiple bacterial species or different targets like proteins. And so we think that they could be used for more complete microbiome analysis in the future. And that's something we're really excited about. What's currently used in, what, what, what's currently used? What are the techniques? Yeah, so there's some genetic sequencing techniques that are popular. Um, some of them are called shotgun sequencing or they'll use the, what's known as the 16S RDNA gene to look at, you know, what does that gene look like in every single different um, species that is in a sample? And so basically that's, again, looking at that genetic information and identifying species that way. And that's a really complicated and, and time-consuming and expensive method, but it's really cool because we get a lot of rich data from that. And another method that's commonly used is cell culturing. So taking a sample, say from like a skin swab or even from your poop to get information about your intestinal microbiome and culturing what's in there and letting it grow and that also takes a really long time, but then you get to see how the different bacteria interact in a way that you wouldn't get to see by just looking at the genetic information. Oh, because if you're culturing it, it's all growing together? Yeah, it's a little bit more realistic. Sometimes you can't replicate exactly what's happening in the lab, but it's, you get to see a little bit of that interaction and 
what it's like for them to grow and cohabitate. Okay, so I do think before we get more into the techniques, just to make sure I'm understanding right. So I, I've heard of skin microbiome and gut microbiome. I think those are the two that that I had heard about before. And it literally blew my mind when you said that there's tons of them. So there, so is it like every different organ has their own microbiome? Is it just different areas of the body have their own little, what, what's, what is it? How many are there? That's a good question. I don't know if there's like a, a one number for how many there are but you do have a different microbiome in every region of your body and you can learn different things about yourself based on the bacteria that are present in different regions of your body. And so <laughs> lost in your phone there. Um, yeah, so they are, it is different in different organs, but if you think about the skin specifically, uh, technically the skin is an organ, but you have different bacteria in different regions of your skin. So I told you about like the bacteria that you have on your face. Uh, women also have a vaginal microbiome. And so there's different bacteria that are supposed to be there and different ones that if they are found in different numbers could be a problem. So there's actually a really cool paper that I talked about in my review paper that showed that if you have low lactobacillus and high Gardnerella or ureoplasma in your uh, vaginal microbiome that somehow was associated with preterm birth um, for mothers that had given birth. And so uh, there's really interesting and kind of wacky things that you can learn by looking at the levels of bacteria in different regions and how it compares to levels of other bacteria that are living there. Oh, insane. I feel like this is such a field of research that is just going to explode. I think so. I think it's becoming more popular to look into this and I think biosensors could really help with that. So this is, so the reason that we actually got inspired to do this is because you published a mini review paper on the microbiome specifically using biosensors, right? Yeah, that's right. So we were interested in looking at what biosensors have been used for microbiome analysis, which isn't much, um, but we actually wanted to look in general at what biosensors have been used for in the past um, in similar capacities and sort of make an argument for why they should be used for microbiome analysis. What did you, what was the general findings of the, the review? So we found a lot of papers that talked about using biosensors, which maybe I should define a little bit is basically when you have a sensor that is detecting a specific it could be like a molecule or a protein or a bacteria um, using some kind of biological component. And there's a transducer that is changing that signal into something that's really easy to understand, like a color change or electrical signal, something like that. And these kinds of devices tend to be really low cost and portable compared to like the genetic sequencing methods that I was telling you about earlier. They're also a lot faster than culturing methods. And so they're really neat. They're, they've been used for detecting things from complex matrices, which can be difficult because, for example, if you think about your saliva, it's not just water. There's all kinds of proteins and things that can interact and make it hard to detect whatever bacteria you're most interested in. And biosensors are also good for multiplex detection, meaning you can detect multiple different species at once. And in the past, biosensors have only really been used for like detecting maybe two or three different bacteria at the same time. And that's because of some of the challenges with biosensors, but we think if they can be overcome, it could be something that could give you more information about your microbiome in general. So biosensors are potentially handy because they can do complex matrices, example, saliva. And yeah. Then... Yeah. So saliva is one example. Um, your blood is another complex matrix. Um, poop samples are a complex matrix. So all of that is, it becomes a lot more difficult than maybe like detecting something from air or water because there's all these different materials in there that are competing and maybe causing noise that inhibits you from seeing the signal that you really want. Right. I get that. There's just a ton of stuff competing for the, for the signal. Yeah. 
what's the other advantage? Well, I think maybe their main advantage is, uh, especially if you think about the clinical space, how easy it is to make them point of care. And this isn't something we really see yet for microbiome analysis, but like, what if you went in for your health checkup and besides, you know, having your temperature taken or something like that, you could have a quick microbiome scan done maybe on your, your face skin or, um, with a poop sample or something like that, and then get some information about maybe your risk for diabetes or atherosclerosis, or maybe, um, your risk for different skin conditions. Like that's something that isn't happening yet, but I think it could potentially be the future and it could be really helpful information. Mm -hmm. So cool. What, so it sounds like you can detect so many different things from the microbiome. What are some of the, or do you have any examples from the review paper that you, you did? Yeah, so besides the like skin examples I've talked a little bit about, the gut microbiome has been the most studied microbiome um, because there's just a lot of bacteria that you can get from those types of studies. And it's, been, and it's been related to a lot of things. You'd think maybe if you're looking at a poop sample, you might be able to tell about like diet and maybe IBS or like stomach conditions, which is true, but it's interesting that um, you can also learn a lot about like diabetes, obesity, atherosclerosis, just by looking at how much of different uh, bacteria from different genuses or genera, um, like how they compare. So if you have less bacteria from the fecally bacterium genus compared to the Roseburia genus, then you're more at risk of those diseases, which is just crazy to think about how like, how do those bacteria know that? I don't know, but it's something that you could find out. So do we know that those are specifically related to the, to the diseases or, or are they just, um, symptoms? What's the word? Like, do they suggest that it's there? Yeah. I mean, it seems like those, those have been correlated. It's not like we know that for every, <laughs> it's not like we know that for every bacteria or every genus or every species. Um, but there's been correlations made between like different phyla, different genera. And um, once the, I guess, like basic science side of things continues to figure out those correlations, then biosensors can take advantage of that knowledge and apply it towards some kind of clinical setting. Right. So the use of biosensors here is less about figuring out what all the bacteria and the, the things mean, but more once you guys figure that out, this is a tool that can detect it. That's true. And also another point that we made in the review paper is that um, because biosensors are relatively easy to use in a lot of cases, you can collect a lot of data really quickly with them. And so it's possible that biosensors could even help with the data collection side of things too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the thing that's most exciting about biosensors for me is how they could potentially be made as a tool for clinical diagnostics. Again, something we're not seeing yet, but I think it's gonna happen pretty soon. What are the key um, areas that need to improve in order to get there to the point where we're using it for clinical diagnostics? Yeah, that's a great question. There's definitely still some challenges with uh, how I mentioned the interfering signals with having complex matrix. All clinical samples are complex matrices. We're very complicated beings. And so that's, that's always a challenge. There's been some really cool um, advances to get around those challenges, but it's still a problem. And then with the multiplex detection, so you know, for the microbiome, usually you're not just looking for one pathogen, you're looking for a lot of different bacteria. Some of them might be good, some of them might be harmful, and you want to look at all of those at the same time. And there's been, again, some really cool advances there, like with microarrays, uh, where you can spot... What's a like microarray? It's basically like you take a glass slide and you have all these little dots that you make and each dot has its own receptor added to it. And then you add a sample that might have, you know, a million different things in it. 
and then you add a detection receptor like on top of all those dots. Um, and that way you're localizing where this, like the different receptors are and you'll get a signal from each one depending on if the receptors found anything in that sample um, for that specific target that you're looking for. But it, it allows you to look at multiple targets at the same time. So cool, okay, sorry, I interrupted then. What were you? Oh no, you're good. Um, so I think that's a, a really interesting advancement that's made and has been made in multiplex detection. There's definitely still challenges with cross-reactivity, um, which basically just means that something that is supposed to specifically bind only one target could still bind to other targets that you don't want it to if, if they look similar. And so that's an issue with clearly telling the difference between different targets when you want to look at multiple. And so I think those are issues that will need to be overcome as well as just, you know, how do we handle this massive amount of data that we're collecting? And that's kind of where I think machine learning comes in and, and already has started to come in. Right, yeah, so you mentioned machine learning briefly at the end of the paper, and that was really exciting. Uh, it seems like a great way to handle the big data and the complex data. Is there a lot of research there right now? Yeah, so machine learning research has been going on for decades and it's, it's kind of exploded again recently. I mean, it's taking over every industry, every field that we can imagine. Um, and it's definitely moving into the healthcare space and, and has been for a while. Specifically with the microbiome, I think that's relatively new. We were able to cite a few papers that were doing this, um, but I think where the magic will really come in is when we can make these machine learning algorithms capable of predicting maybe risk of a certain disease and then putting those algorithms into biosensors, which like I said, are really portable, easy to use. You can bring it into a clinic without having to wheel it in on a cart. And then you could do some kind of scan or analysis really quickly and get an instant result because the algorithm has already been trained um, outside of the clinic. And so that's what I'm really excited about. So we don't need to go too in depth, but I do think that for people who aren't familiar with machine learning, I know before I learned a bit about it, it sounded so sci-fi and exciting and cool. And then you learn about it and it's just math, <laughs> just some <laughs> algorithms. Can you like explain just briefly? Cause I know you know this stuff, just give us an idea about what the machine learning is doing. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that because I, I do think there's a lot of hype around machine learning that should be, um, but also a lot of misunderstanding and maybe kind of hopes let down in terms of what people expected versus what it actually is. Um, machine learning isn't, you know, like uh, machines coming to life and like taking over the world um, as cool or scary as that would be, but essentially there's a, uh, you can have just kind of basic algorithms, right? Where you tell a computer, okay, if you see this, then do that. Or if this happens then do this. Um, and machine learning is, is novel and unique from that because you're training a computer on some examples of what it might see in the future. And then you're testing that algorithm with completely new data that it's never seen before. And so it's not like you're hard coding specific responses, but you're training it to know what to do with similar data in the future. And uh, so maybe an example would help for like how we kind of see this playing out with microbiome data. Um, so we could train an algorithm to look at pictures of different bacteria on the skin. And once and we feed in the information about, okay, these images that we're showing you right now are E. coli, and these images that we're showing you right now are staph aureus. And so it, it knows the ground truth and it's learning that information. And then in the future, it will see images from maybe a patient that's coming in and wants to know what's on their skin. And since it's been trained, it can use that learning that it's acquired to make a prediction about uh, future images, but it is very targeted and specific. Um, you can't, at least right now, it's, it's not like you can train a computer to do something and now it can just like replace a human and do everything. 
Um, it learns how to do very specific tasks. And then it's often been shown that a machine learning algorithm can outperform clinicians with different tasks. So they're very useful tools, I think. And are all of the machine learning um, papers that you are finding, are they processing the data, getting the variables and putting those variables in, or are they putting images in? I don't think uh, that we had any examples with images, um, more like that's, a, that's an example that we're interested in actually, but sometimes it's more like extracting different variables that you're interested in and feeding that information in and seeing if the machine can find patterns that maybe aren't obvious to a human observer. And that can be really cool too. Yeah, saves our brains. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, what else do we need to cover then? Because this is, I love this. This is so interesting. Um, yeah, I feel like we covered a lot. Do you have- We, we hit our questions? bullet points, didn't we? <laughs> Let's see. We've explained microbiome, microbiota, biosensors, tapped into machine learning. So cool. So then I guess my last question was just a little personal opinion from you. Like, I think you've already touched on it, why you're excited about it, but where do you see this field going? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think, I definitely hope it will move into the clinics more. I think that's something that will happen. Um, there's obviously a lot of, like ethical things that will need to get worked out. Like when is it necessary to tell someone about the risk of a certain disease versus when is that information just not helpful? But I think if we handle that stuff well, it, this could be really useful for helping doctors and physicians. Again, I think the goal isn't to like replace different people. It's just to make their lives easier by filtering out all this massive data that we're collecting on people uh, when they enter a health clinic and helping our clinicians like take care of us better, so. Love it. <laughs> so exciting. And I think I actually understand it a lot better now. I thank you again, like so much for doing this. It's really cool that you can walk me through this paper that I've heard about and I've skimmed through now read, but it's so much easier to just have somebody in front of you answer your questions and walk me through it. Before this, I didn't even really quite understand what a microbiome was. So it's very useful. I'm super glad anytime <laughs> we sit right next to each other in, in lab, so. <laughs> but this is official and this oh, yeah. forces us to learn. So it's better. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, awesome. Um, I definitely would like to have you back on. There are so many other things you're researching right now that we could talk about. So I'm super excited for that in the future. That sounds awesome. I'll be here. Yay. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Lane.